Everybody good on sound? Okay, perfect. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Paco Balderrama, Fresno Police Chief, and here joining me at this press conference is uh, Captain John Reynolds with the Fresno Sheriff's Department, Lisa Smithcamp, our uh, District Attorney, uh, Special Agent Sean Reagan with the Sacramento Office of the FBI, our U.S. Attorney Phil Talbert, uh, from the Clovis Police Department, Lieutenant Jim Koch, and we have a uh, Chief of uh, uh, the Probation Office here in Fresno County, Kirk Haynes. We are here to announce the apprehension of 44-year-old Scott Anderson, who we believe is connected to several bombing incidents in the Fresno area. Shortly, you will be receiving a list of seven separate incidents, bombing incidents, all related to bombings since December the 13th of last year. On January the 8th of 2023, detectives from the Northwest Policing District responded to 3560 West San, so San Jose Avenue for a pipe bomb detonation under a vehicle. Based on the evidence that they observed and gathered on that day, detectives learned that there was an additional pipe bomb detonated inside the same vehicle on January the 6th, just two days prior. Detectives were able to identify Anderson as a prime suspect in both the uh, January 6th and the January 8th cases. Fresno PD detectives were then able to obtain additional evidence on additional bombings that occurred on uh, starting December the 13th at uh, 5674 East Clinton. So I can tell you that, and you will be receiving a list of this, of, of these individual bombings, but we had one, uh, 5674 East Clinton on December the 13th, uh, the two incidents on January the 6th and January the 8th um, at 3560 West San Jose Avenue, January the 27th at 2763 North Argyle, uh, also on January the 27th at 5674 East Clinton. Uh, February the 19th, 377 West Fallbrook Avenue. And then at the probation office for Fresno County on February the 21st. That is where a, a probation vehicle was targeted and destroyed. So it became apparent very quickly that the suspect or suspects in this case were progressing in skill level uh, of making bombs and also their frequency. Additionally, or additional evidence provided a link between Anderson and what we believe is a white supremacist group. Three separate locations related to Anderson were identified and search warrants were authored for all three locations. A Ramey warrant uh, for the arrest of Anderson was also authored. Fresno police working hand in hand with the FBI, the US Attorney's Office and the, um, Oklahoma, or, I'm sorry, the, the Fresno County District Attorney's Office uh, plan to apprehend Anderson and safely search the three locations with the assistance of uh, Fresno Sheriff's Office and Clovis PD. The initial plan had to be called off. When Anderson left the Fresno area on February the 23rd, going south through the grapevine just before severe weather came in. Fresno PD and the FBI began sharing information with our Southern law enforcement partners in California so they can be aware of these individuals and what they were wanted for. Intelligence information was developed that Anderson was staying in a casino in Temecula, California. On February the 24th, the, Fres I'm sorry, the Riverside County Sheriff's Office came into contact with Anderson on a traffic stop, and they were able to take him and his partner, 56-year-old Frank Rocha, into custody safely. The search of the vehicle took about three hours, and an evacuation had to take place in the surrounding area. Once we were notified of the capture, the warrant search was reinitiated with the help of Fresno Sheriff's Office and Clovis PD. The operations plan and search used a lot of resources and was described by one veteran SWAT supervisor as one of the most complex and difficult uh, due to the risk of explosives and sensitive nature of the operation. To say that I am proud and impressed and extremely appreciative 
to the men and women who put so much work and effort into this case is an understatement. I want to thank Detectives Jason Button, Sha Tao from the Northwest Policing District for their help and tireless work on this case. This includes their leadership, Captain Martinez, Lieutenant Brian Pierce, and Sergeant Justin Harvey, along with Northeast Detectives Darrington and Gallavis. And of course, we want to thank the Riverside Sheriff's Office for making the apprehension. I did get an opportunity to speak to Chad Bianco, the sheriff, um, earlier today and uh, to express my appreciation, but uh, he in turn said thank you to us for sharing the information with him so quickly. Uh, I also want to thank obviously our partners in this, the FBI, the Clovis Police Department, um, Fresno Sheriff's Office, uh, our SWAT magic personnel, and also district safety teams who helped um, with this operation and with the execution of the search warrants. With that being said, um, I want to give you guys, uh, describe briefly the things that were found in the search warrants, and that includes, um, so the search warrants occur in three different locations, the 1300 block of West Dyer Avenue, the 5900 block of East Alta Avenue, and the 3500 block of West San Jose Avenue. At least one of these is in the Fresno County Island, so that's why we had FSO assisting us. 11 legal firearms were recovered, that includes four handguns, five rifles, three shotguns, um, several hundred rounds of ammunition, uh, almost 90 grams of methamphetamine packaged for sale, and about $50,000 in cash. So now, before we have uh, some of our other uh, law enforcement leaders speak today, I wanna show you guys a video of one of those explosions. So cue that up, please. Obviously there you saw a suspect vehicle pull up and they um, deployed the device into the vehicle and you can see it was completely a loss of a vehicle, completely incinerated. So now I would like to ask our U.S. Attorney Phil Tabard to say a few words and then have our District Attorney uh, Lisa Smith there say a few words. Hi again, I'm Phil Talbert. I'm the United States Attorney for the Eastern District of California. Uh, on Monday, my office filed a criminal complaint bringing federal charges against Scott Eric Anderson for three pipe bombings in the Fresno area and for being a felon in possession of a firearm. As alleged in the federal complaint, the three pipe bombings that are charged all damaged vehicles that are involved in interstate commerce. The complaint alleges that on or about December 13th, 2022, Anderson used an explosive device to damage a pickup truck belonging to an auto-related business on Clinton Avenue and parked in a parking lot next to the business. It also alleges that on or about January 27, 2023, Anderson used an explosive device to damage a car belonging to a second auto-related business, also on Clinton Avenue and parked in the same parking lot. The complaint also alleges that on or about February 19, 2023, Anderson used an explosive device to damage a car leased to a home health care business on Fallbrook Avenue. Additionally, the complaint alleges that Anderson possessed at his home in Fresno a 45 caliber Springfield Armory XD pistol that was manufactured outside the state of California and that he was prohibited from possessing firearms because he is a convicted felon. Investigators seized the pistol from the master bedroom during the execution of a search warrant on Anderson's home 
that had been authorized by a Fresno County Superior Court judge. Now, I want to thank the Fresno Police Department, the Fresno County Sheriff's Office, the FBI, and the ATF for all of their hard work on this investigation. Uh, this case is really a great example of the positive results that can be achieved when local and federal law enforcement authorities combine their resources and expertise to investigate criminal conduct like this that threatens the safety of the community. I also want to uh, thank the Fresno County District Attorney's Office, uh, which again is a great partner with my office as we determine what charges are best pursued in federal court and what ones are best pursued in superior court. Uh, finally, I want to thank my own Assistant United States Attorney, Mike Tierney, who has been working hard on this uh, investigation and case uh, from the beginning. We filed this complaint on Monday, but the investigation has not concluded. This type of the type of conduct that is charged here, a series of pipe bombs detonated at Fresno area businesses, is something my office takes very seriously. In coordination with our law enforcement partners, we're going to pursue this matter to hold all who are involved accountable for their actions. And may I introduce the Fresno County uh, District Attorney, Lisa Smith. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I want to just congratulate uh, Chief Balduama and your team. Detectives, great job, and all of our allied partners. Once again, this is an example of um, how well things work here in Fresno between the federal, state, and local authorities. Uh, in this case, the people of the state of California will be filing, uh, have filed a criminal complaint uh, alleging four different defendants for the, the actions that we have been speaking about that occurred in January and February of 2023. <clears throat> Scott Anderson has been charged with three counts of violating Penal Code Section 18740, which is the exploding of a destructive device, and also one count of an attempt of that crime. He's also been charged with one count of arson pursuant to Penal Code Section 451D. Furthermore, he will be uh, also charged with violations of Penal Code Section 18720, possession of material to make a destructive device, as well as one count of being a possession and felon of a firearm. He will also be uh, charged in violation of Penal Code Section 30605, possession of an assault weapon, and 30305, um, a felon in possession of ammunition. Mr. Anderson is currently in custody in the Fresno County Jail on a no bail status. His exposure for his state charges is 12 years and six months in the California Department of Corrections. He will be arraigned this afternoon and is probably being arraigned as we speak. The second defendant that has been charged in the state court in the state cr criminal complaint is Stephen Burkett. Mr. Burkett is charged with eight counts of Penal Code Section 29800, Felon in Possession of a Firearm, as well as one count of Penal Code Section 30305, Felon in Possession of Ammunition. For these charges, Mr. Burkett is facing 16 years and eight months in the California Department of Corrections, and he is currently in custody on bail um, set at $715,000. He also is expected to be arraigned this afternoon. The third defendant is a person by the name of Paul New. Mr. New has been charged with two counts of Penal Code Section 29800, Felon in Possession of a Firearm, as well as 30305, Felon in Possession of Ammunition, and one count of Penal Code Section 18720, Possession of Material to Make a Destructive Device. Mr. New's exposure is 10 years in the California Department of Corrections, and his bail is currently set at $280,000. He also is expected to be arraigned this afternoon. The fourth and final defendant that will be charged in the Superior Court is a female by the name of Amanda Sanders. She is facing a violation of Health and Safety Code Section 11378, possession of methamphetamine for sale. Her exposure is three years in the uh, local jail under 1170H. Her bail was set at um, $25,000 and she posted that bond. She is set for an arraignment on May the 1st of 2023 in the uh, Fresno County Superior Court. This case is going to be prosecuted by Deputy District Attorney Kyle McPherson in our MAGIC unit. And at this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to Special Agent in Charge from the FBI, Sean Reagan. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. 
Um, you've heard the facts of this investigation. Uh, I would just like to thank the Fresno Police Department, Chief Balderrama and his whole team for their leadership in this matter. They, uh, the, the explosion goes off. Of course, they're the first ones on the scene. Patrol officers are there taking a leadership role. Call in detectives, obviously notify their command. They put all of the resources they can to keep the community safe. Uh, and they do that each and every day. Um, and they call in then when we're dealing with explosives, bomb technicians, right? The, the EOD teams that handle those types of dangerous devices. A lot of times we don't talk about what they do, uh, but those specialized units uh, and resources are specially trained to handle very dangerous uh, explosive chemicals. Uh, and they put their lives on the line every day in doing that. And they do that every day, literally. Uh, and in this case, we're talking about explosives that actually detonated uh, and were, were very dangerous indeed. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them for the work that they do. It often, often go, goes unsung, uh, but they protect all of us. Um, and so, as I mentioned, uh, Chief Balderrama and the Fresno Police Department really took the lead on this. Uh, they realized this was a significant investigation and it, it was connected and the, the various explosions, uh, various incidents were connected. They then asked all of us who are standing here, their, their partners, to come in and assist, uh, which we always do. Um, and that's the other thing that probably the, the people of Fresno and this area should realize, is that the partnerships in this area are just outstanding. And anytime any of us need any of assistance in anything that we're doing, we call on our partners and we come together at a moment's notice to jointly work a, a problem to help protect Fresno community, uh, and this case was no different. Uh, and so, Chief, thank you. Thank you to the, the department for continuing to lead in this. This is an ongoing investigation, and we'll continue to work it as a team. Thank you. I want to turn it over to the Chief Probation Officer uh, for Fresno County, Mr. Haynes. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to, um, to Chief Balderrama. Uh, I want to say thank you to um, Sheriff Zanoni, I also want to say thank you to our District Attorney Smithcamp and also to all of our law enforcement, uh, federal law enforcement partners um, in uh, the uh, apprehension of, of this group of people. Um, as you've got, got a chance to see on the video, um, the vehicle that was uh, last destroyed was one of our probation vehicles and, um, you know, it really goes uh, a lot to looking at the escalation of, of what's happened with this group of individuals. As you can see, they esca escalated to the point where they were targeting law enforcement, and it's uh, and it's really important that you know all of us pull together uh, to make sure that uh, anything that we can do to try to make sure that our, our law enforcement personnel stay safe, and uh, and of course all of the community also stay safe in light of the, the violent acts of this group of people. So I just want to say thank you so much for the coordination of the effort of all that have been involved in the work that we've done. Also want to say thank you to um, some of my staff who actually had to, res to uh, respond that night. Um, uh, Deputy Chief Joy Thompson and also Assistant Deputy Chief uh, Christine Reese for their work and working with investigators to make sure that we can insist on making sure that we could identify the, sp the suspect as quickly as possible. So again, I just want to say thank you so much for the work and the effort that we put forth. Thank you. Before I open it up to questions, I do want to make a couple of things clear. Obviously, you can see the paraphernalia behind me that, you know, looks, looks to be Nazi paraphernalia, possibly racist paraphernalia. Um, this is still very early on in the investigation. The arrest was just made on Friday. Uh, we have a lot of evidence and information to look through. Um, a, a lot of the pieces of evidence are still being processed. Uh, at this point, we cannot say that the motivation was uh, a, a hate crime or whether the victims were targeted because of their um, race. We, we can't say that for certain. That's a possibility, and we haven't solidified the connections to white supremacist group, but is that a possibility? Yes, it is. To what extent? Uh, at this point, we don't know. So, any questions? Uh, as I just said, uh, we're still trying to confirm any ties to uh, white supremacist groups, hate groups. Uh, so, we can't say with 100% certainty that there is a connection. Yeah, so out of the seven events, uh, six of them involve vehicles being destroyed. Uh, one of them involves a, a mailbox, and, and we were able to uh, connect all seven events to, to, to that individual. Who else is connected? 
we're still we're still making this case. As far as incidents that have occurred in other places, we, we don't know yet. Uh, these these investigations tend to be very complex. Uh, they they require experts in bomb making and materials and things like that. And that's why we sought the help of the FBI to not only help us with the case, but also to help us process the scenes. But you know, all I can tell, all we can tell you for for certain is the information that we're giving you today that we're handing out, which is the seven incidents, the people involved, what they're charged with, and, and what we found at, at various locations. Uh, yeah, so the times are also there in the list, and I haven't gone through them. I think most of them are in, in the cover of darkness. Let's see, 10 p.m., 2 a.m., 2 a.m., 2 a.m., 2 a.m., 3.45 a.m., and 3 a.m. So uh, we did establish a pattern of behavior uh, with the prime suspect. Once we developed information of, of who, who he was, we were able to do a little bit of surveillance, and, and, we, and we found a trend. Uh, again, going back to the operation on the 23rd, uh, we, we were all dressed up and ready to go and uh, this individual uh, left um, the area. So we, we held off, you know. Uh, one of our concerns was that uh, we were gonna apprehend this or, or stop this individual while he was mobile. We didn't know what they had in the vehicle. Uh, we certainly didn't expect them to give up. So that was a major concern. So, so we were, the original plan was to uh, execute the search and the arrest warrants at his locale, but then, but then he left. Uh, but then the Riverside County Sheriff's Office did us a, a huge favor by apprehending this individual. You know, I, I don't know what was found in the vehicle at this point, and it's still being processed, and I don't want to divulge too much information because it's going to be part of the case. But uh, certainly they, they treated it as a very serious matter. Uh, of course, you know, it, it shut down a section of the city for about three hours, and rightfully so. They had to make sure that there was nothing in that vehicle that was going to hurt their officers or the community. You know, we have no, we have no reason to believe that they're going to stop. You know, frankly, they were getting better. They were becoming more frequent. They were spacing them out, but uh, we, we, we saw a frequency, we saw a pattern. So th there's nothing that would lead us to believe that they were gonna stop. So that's why it was so important for us to uh, investigate this quickly. So we, we didn't wanna wait until somebody was killed, somebody was hurt. Uh, we certainly were gonna, were gonna sit on this one. So we acted quickly and, and it worked out. Uh, he does have a criminal history. I don't know what that is. Or do you? I know he's a convicted felon. There were basic uh, pipe bombs. I'm not a bomb tech, and I'm not going to you know, get up here and, and claim to be one. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, we found several materials that, that uh, led us to believe that they were looking to enhance their own skills. So you start with something basic, and then, and then you grow, and then, then you make it bigger. And that was our concern. Um, you know, as far as what the motivation was, we, we can't say 100% you know, for certain what their motivation was, but it wasn't, it wasn't good. It wasn't good intentions. Well, I, I have a message for our community, and, and um, I want our community to know that it is our prime responsibility to keep them safe. And uh, uh, the Fresno Police Department, along with every single agency that's represented up here today, is committed to keeping our, our community safe. And that's exactly what we did. You know, we acted quickly, we worked in concert, and we made a solid case on some very dangerous people. So um, I, think, I think the message speaks for, its, for itself, for any others who might try to do something like this, that uh, we're gonna take this very seriously. We'll have to look that up. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we did. I'm sure we have. No injuries, just thousands of dollars in damage, you know, to, to multiple vehicles, which is, you know, bad enough. And just the, 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 uh, the fact that they targeted a law enforcement vehicle uh, was of great concern to us uh, because if someone's that bold, then, you know, what, what else could they possibly do? Um, so, you know, regardless, we acted very quickly and we got the information uh, down south to our partners and, and it worked. You know, they were able to stop this individual on a traffic stop, take him into custody safely, uh, render the vehicle safe. And, uh, you know, for, for now, you know, it's still an ongoing case, but the, the bad guys are in jail as they should be. No, no. And, and, and again, we can't, uh, we can't ascertain uh, what their motive was. You know, obviously, you see the the um, uh, the racial paraphernalia. The paraphernalia can be associated with white supremacist groups. Uh, it, was that their motivation? We don't know at this point. You know, we can't say for certain, but it's certainly something that we're going to try to find out. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know, but given the uh, time times of day, uh, I doubt it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. They're friends. Yeah, the Forest Ali Ahmed, I don't know, but they they all associate with one another. And uh, Rocha was found with Anderson. Um, you know, uh, the one that we can say for certain that is involved is Anderson. As far as what other role the other ones played in, you know, we, we still don't know. Uh, yeah, the probation the, the probation officer, yeah, who who was uh, following Anderson, yeah, he knows that guy pretty well. No, no, and and again, we haven't made a connection, and we're, we're not going to speculate on any connection. Uh, we do believe these attacks were pretty random. No, it, it could be. It's it's quite possible, and maybe even probable that they were uh, testing their own skills and abilities. You know, they were. Hey, can I pull this off? Okay, pull it off once. Can I pull it off again? Can I do it? Hey, can, now can we target a, a law enforcement agency and get away with it? So again, we, we saw their behavior progressing, and uh, in a dangerous manner. And it was just a matter of time before you know they did this. You know, during the day or in a populated area of a, a business filled with people. No, there isn't. Thousands of dollars. Uh, about fifty thousand dollars would I pay for mine? First thing I would have to pay for you. Yeah, so you know, so so my perspective on this one is just this: is that we were able to um, make arrests before anybody was seriously hurt. Um, was it dangerous? Sure, it was dangerous. As I said earlier, you know, I, I got a, a individual um, on on the SWAT team who's got 20 years experience who described this as one of the most complex uh, operations. Why? Because it, it dealt with so many things. It's one thing when you're just going to go to a, a house to apprehend somebody. It's a lot different when you have multiple locations, when those locations could possibly have bomb-making material, where uh, guns may be present, where the motivation may be uh, to not give up to police to, to, to fight, that, that makes it all that more um, complex. And that's why the involvement of the FBI, the Corpus Police Department, Fresno County Sheriff's Office was critical. You know, uh, we don't have, even though we're a large agency, we, we, we could not have done this alone. And, and we don't do things by ourselves here in, in the Valley. You know, we always include our partners so we can do it and do it right. And uh, everybody deserves credit um, for, for, for their efforts, uh, but especially my team, especially my two detectives who who, who really made this case, they cracked the case, they got the information, they were supported by their leaders. And, you know, obviously once I found out, you know, it was, it was you know, green light go. Yeah, I think that's the thing that we have to do is to really try and find the threat and try and find the people that are going to be able to take care of the threat and take care of the situation. Yeah, it, 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 it took us about two days, you know, about 16 hours of just deliberating and then several tactical meetings to, to, to solve this. So, so think of this as just a, just a big puzzle that we had to solve. And uh, it's not just solving it, it's also doing it safely and doing it without the loss of life and doing it without putting our um, our police officers in harm's way, which which they were, either way they, they still were. Because anytime you approach a house, unless you have um, intelligence of what's inside the house, you just don't know. And then when you're when you're going after bombers, you know, serial bombers, where well, it makes it that much more dangerous. So definitely very com complicated, but again, that's why I go back and I say that um, you know, this is, you know, in my, in my 25 years, this is one of the, the, the best operations, um, the best teamwork, uh, the best um, incident where we were able to put our resources together and, and get the job done and get it done safely. Yeah, so we're going to give you a sheet, and that sheet's going to have the actual charges. Uh, the only one who's being charged right now in the connection of the bombings is going to be Anderson. But, you know, some of these other individuals were found at the locations where we served the search warrant, where they have there. They had meth, they had guns, they had ammunition, they had paraphernalia. Um, so, so a lot of those charges are going to be charged in Superior Court because at this point they're state charges. Now, if, if at some point we can prove that there's a bomb making, um, you know, across state lines, then, then, then our, our federal partners will make sure that they charge them with the appropriate charges. Okay, uh, Rocha is still in Riverside, so he's pending extradition. The only one who's here is Anderson. And that's because uh, Fresno Sheriff's Office picked him up for us. They had to go a long way because of the uh, severe weather. Yeah, 
no, uh, there's still a lot that we need to wrap up on this one, uh, but obviously it was very important for us to um, let our media partners and our community know of, of just what, you know, of, of this great arrest, but also the potential for danger. So we ask the public to always get involved. You know, if they suspect somebody's involved in, in actions such as bomb making or uh, some type of extreme, extremist group, obviously we want to know about it so we can do our part to keep the community safe. But if there's no more questions, thank you. Yes. Oh, go ahead. It's, it is not gated, but we are planning to, to gate that parking lot. But uh, we've been in that building for about, we've been there for about five years. But, uh, but no, we've never had this kind of an incident obviously happen before. So we are, certainly are now looking at, uh, at gating that parking lot. I don't know. We'll make sure we ask him next time we talk to him. But yeah, we don't. We don't. We don't. He doesn't have a history. He doesn't have any previous charges in bomb making. Any other questions? Thank you very much for for covering this. We appreciate it.